Welcome to a special edition of the Marketplace Roundtable podcast featuring Jay Mintzmeyer of Value Investors Edge. Jay first began contributing to Seeking Alpha in 2011, building up a large following through his work covering shipping stocks, probably about as comprehensively as they're covered anywhere online or in print. Since 2015, Jay has run the Value Investors Edge Marketplace service here at Seeking Alpha. The service offers intensive coverage of deep value opportunities in the shipping, energy, MLP, and industrial sectors. You can subscribe to Value Investors Edge by going to SeekingAlpha.com and typing J. Mintzmeyer, that's M-I-N-T-Z-M-Y-E-R, or Value Investors Edge into the search bar at the top of the site. Before we begin, a brief disclaimer. Seeking Alpha is a website where authors from around the world share their ideas and analysis on the stock market. The Marketplace is our platform for authors to run investing analysis and idea services so that readers can take their investing to the next level. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. And now your host, Jay Mintzmeyer. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another iteration of Value Investors Edge Live, recording on the afternoon of 9 June 2021, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Time. We're hosting Gary Vogel, the CEO of Eagle Bulk, to talk to us about the dry bulk market, uh, particularly the midsize segment. As a reminder, nothing on the conversation today constitutes official company guidance or investment recommendations with any form. With that said, welcome, Gary. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a really exciting time in the dry bulk market after you know several years of downturn and a COVID crisis last year and, and all sorts of stuff going on. So we're excited to have you here today. Um, we want to jump right into it and, and talk about the current strength in mid-sized dry bulk rates. It's been very sustainable as well, uh, very low volatility, which is which is surprising for dry bulk, just steady strength. So what, what's going on in this market and, and what are the main drivers? Yeah, so I mean, as you said, you know, we've had uh, a challenging number of years, not not just COVID, but if we go back, uh, you know, Asian swine flu impacting soybeans, trade wars, tariffs, Dalai Dam collapse, things, all of those things, and and here we are now, um, coming out of out of COVID, first led by China, and you know, just sustained demand at the moment across really broadly. I mean, that's one of the things about the mid-sized segment is that we carry all the major bulks, but but all the minor bulks as well. So we have much more diversity in terms of commodity demand as well as, as you know, geography as, as well. So, you know, I'd say the, the lead for us uh, has been the grain uh, grain trade, you know, uh, on the back of phase one, which, you know, goes back quite a while now, you know, China has been buying U.S. soybeans, which really has been absent for three years. And that's combined with, you know, a, a resurgence of the of the pig herd in China. So last year, China imported about 100 million tons of soybean. It's expected to be up somewhat, but then even uh, wheat and corn is is really up dramatically this year. It's a much lower number um, than than soybeans, but but up about 40 percent year over year, and that was up over 2019. So we're not even talking just about a kind of recovery, you know, from a from a, a week, you know, a year around COVID. So you know, those are the kinds of things that are that are happening. We also are having a, a bit of a enjoying some of the spillover trade from the container market. You know, containers are so strong, as you know, that we're carrying uh, bag cargoes that typically would be stuffed in containers to places, particularly West Coast, Central, South America, whether that's bag fertilizer, small bag cement, um, e- even even some semi-finished steel, um, small stuff that typically would go in containers we're seeing on our ship. So it's nice to see it broad-based and, and um, you know, we, we feel that that's a pretty nice uh, matchup against what we think is, you know, a really muted supply picture going forward. Yeah, it's certainly quite the setup, and and the order book is something we've been watching closely for the last couple of years, and and we were so stoked to see that there was almost no orders in 2020, and there's still almost no orders year to date this year, which is just fantastic to see. We're hoping it stays that way. Uh, one of the questions that we or one of the items we focused on, and a question I had personally is, you know, this China Australia coal war or tension or spat or whatever you want to call it, um, it, it's definitely added some ton mileage, but how big of an impact is that? Is, is that a major factor or is it just a little bit of noise? No, I think it, it's a major factor at the moment, you know, how long it, it plays out and, and how durable it is, you know, remains to be seen. But, um, you know, or, or I read one report that said that long haul coal trade uh, to China increased from 10% to 24%. And that's pretty significant when you're talking about replacing trade from Australia to China, 
um, from the U.S. Uh, U.S. to China. And in fact, we typically, you know, supermax, ultramax vessels don't carry coal from Australia to China. Our, our the coal that we carry is mostly Indonesian coal uh, to China, and that's uh, that was about 33 percent of Chinese imports, you know, last year. And this year, year to date, it's 53 percent. So even though it's short haul, that's up, and we're actually We've also carried a few, not not I don't want to overstate it, but we've carried a few Met coal cargos from from the U.S. to to China as well. So we're definitely we're seeing a positive result of that, and increased ton miles is 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 directionally positive too. Okay, so it's it's definitely a factor, but it's one of many. It sounds like that's it's driving this market up. Um, what what do you think the difference is between and, and I know there's more seasonality in cape sizes. And I know I, you're not a cape size player, but the cape sizes are extremely volatile. But the uh, super maxes in particular, also the panamaxes and especially the handies, very strong, very steady, no weakness whatsoever. Uh, what's kind of driving that difference between those two markets? Well, I think I think what you know, I talked about, right, that broad-based demand across, you know, many, many uh, commodities. And the one thing I left out, which which is important, is is really a lot of commodities related to building. We've seen significant, uh, we're moving a lot of cement, aggregates, gypsum, uh, slag, which is used in cement production. So, you know, the thing about the Cape market is it, it's dominated, of course, by iron ore and coal. And that supports, you know, power power generation and, and steel production. And so the reason for the volatility is when those two things are on and moving uh, significantly, obviously, you know, those Cape size vessels become in demand. And when the switch gets turned off, um, that's what they carry and, and they can't go elsewhere. We, we really are able to pivot. And in fact, when we have a ship coming out of China, as an example, you know, there might be 15, 20 different types of cargoes and directions we might go in versus a Cape size vessel which pretty much is going to bow us south. So, so it's just really a different dynamic. I mean, I wouldn't call our market, you know, not volatile by by kind of normal standards, but in shipping, abs- absolutely far less volatile historically than the larger sizes. Yeah, there's certainly a, a big difference between the two markets. I mean, obviously, it's the same segment, dry bulk, but definitely a difference between each one of the segments. And, and that's important to keep in mind, right, when comparing a company like maybe Eagle Bulk to something like Golden Ocean, right? It's just a little bit different of a of a market focus there. We've been watching the FFA curves a, a lot the last few months. And, you know, the 2022 FFAs, they started ridiculously low. And I would say now they're still moderate to slightly weak, which which is interesting because, you know, we all know the order book is basically non-existent in the next year. We all expect the demand to keep growing, uh, but the FFAs are, are in heavy backwardation. So do you, do you think this signals anything? Is it just a reluctance of the market to like buy into this rally or is, is there anything else going on there? No, I think I think it's the, the last statement that you made, right? It's been uh, with, with varying um, you know moments of, of, of optimism or green shoots, it's really been it's 11 years since we've had a market. We're at, right now we're at 27,500 uh, as of today, and it's been pretty steady. But it's been 10, you know 11 years uh, since we've been back at those levels. So I think it's taken a while for people to believe that this isn't just a blip um, and, and a short-term anomaly. But you know overnight the Cal 22 market was up almost a thousand dollars for us. You know, you know now in excess of 17. In fact, the first half of the year. You know, traded at 18.1 today. So you know that's up from you know 12.13 just just a couple months ago. So I think, and, and we're seeing uh, longer period fixtures done as well. Clearly, with a, a very high correlation, you know, between the the futures derivatives market and and the physical. So people are 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 willing to commit now and 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 you know putting chips on the table. And so I think you'll con- continue to see it. But I'm not surprised. At the backwardation, notwithstanding, you know, our, our constructive view on on supply demand fundamentals, you know, it's been a long time. If it's not that long ago, you go back to January first, and the forward market for this year was sub ten thousand, right? So, so you know, it's moved very quickly, and, and you know, obviously, you know, when you look out at Cal twenty two, you know, that doesn't even start for another six plus months. So, it's it's I think there's good reason to understand why why people have been a little reluctant to bid it up. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to get past that bias. And I mean, container ships even right now are, are, are facing a similar headwind, right, where the, the rates are going up and up and there's even four and five year charters and it's still hard for people to kind of wrap their heads around, oh, it's it's a different market now. Um, is, is there anything going on in, in the uh, time charter market? Are you getting any inquiries for one or two or three year fixtures or is it all pretty much spot at this point? 
No, there, there's definitely a period fixing going on, um, and you know, one year one year deals and 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 what have you. When it comes to chartering vessels out, you know, we prefer to hedge cash flows or or lock, monetize lock in forward cash flows using the derivative market. And the main reason for that is, you know, we have an active management approach to our fleet, all with a view to outperforming the index. And when you when you let your vessel, you lose that tool in the toolbox. By by using derivatives, we keep the vessel and keep the optionality, but but obviously, um, you know, we we lock in a, the revenue stream for for a vessel on on each contract. So it's not that we won't relet a ship, um, but we think you know there's an inherent negative bias to a ship relet for the reason I mentioned. Plus, whenever you relet a vessel, um, you know, there's an optional period in terms of redelivery. In other words, if you fix a ship for a year, whether out or in, it's typically something like about nine to about 12 months and about means 15 days legally in shipping. So so that's eight and a half to 12 and a half months. And that option will be used against you as an owner. If the market's low, you'll get the ship back, you know, at eight and a half months. And if it's high at 12 and a half months, that's that's a pretty significant, you know, window free option you're giving away. Um, we like to get options, not give them. And so we charter ships in uh, to supplement our fleet. But, but unless we're, we feel we're being paid fair value for that option, um, we typically won't relet our, our ships. So if I'm hearing you correctly, Gary, you're saying you're not really interested in, in time charter outs unless we had like, you know, multiple, like high duration, multiple year, way above normal rates. Uh, nothing around here seems that appealing yet. Well, the thing is we can use the derivatives for the next year if that if that's what we want to do. So if that's not available and a, and a multi-year charter is, then then clearly that's better value. But, but for six months or, or one year, you know, we think the the derivatives are more interesting in general for Eagle. Having said that, you know, when we have a ship open in a in a certain position where a charterer needs that vessel and is willing to pay up for it, we do relet ships. So we have ships out on on short term, uh, short term, you know, time charters. Um, but but again, it's all with a view. That when we look at that, we say, what is that compared to keeping the vessel and selling selling an FFA? Yeah, certainly. And and I think, you know, there's a couple of companies. We we spoke with Starbolt the other day and, and they're of course sophisticated as well. But there's only a few companies that are really active in, in the sort of hedging business and, and derivative selling and that sort of thing. So just to, you know, clarify the mechanics of that, you're, you are you basically saying you would sell like a like a Q three twenty one FFA out on the market and then if the market goes up, you just supplement it with your ship on the market, but if the market goes down, you've blocked in the cash flow. Is that kind of the thought process? Well, well, it's actually symmetrical either way. So effectively, if, if you were to sell a Q3 contract, I mean, as of today, the, the Q3, um, you know, Baltic, the Supermax uh, Q3 is at 28500 so slightly contango to the spot market. If you were to sell that today at, at 28500 and the market went to 30 you would lose $1,500 a day on the contract, but your ship would theoretically be earning $30,000 a day if it was a if it was an index type ship. I mean, there's of course basis risk between a physical, but but in theory you would lose $1,500 on that ship compared to the 20, I'm uh, sorry, on the derivative compared to the 28.5, but you'd earn more than 28.5 on your vessel. So they would offset each other. Because because your vessels are have been outperforming the index on average. So you're capturing, not only are you locking in that cash flow, you're also ideally capturing some sort of spread, you know, $1,500 or whatever it is. Correct. Okay, excellent. Yeah, it's it's just a little bit more of a I think a sophisticated approach than and some of the other companies take. So it, it's good to see that you're doing that and, and you've able to, especially now, right? Because Q3 is is fairly strong, the FFA market, and, and Q4 is picking up. Uh, I hope you're not doing that too much on Cal 22, but <laughs> the Q3 stuff is is looking good. Um, let's pivot a little bit and talk big picture company, you know, out, capital allocation priorities and that sort of thing. Um, what is your target leverage for the company, like on the terms of like debt to assets? What what are you striving to get to? I, I imagine it's a little bit lower than it is currently. Yeah, so I, I think it's important. You know, our our view is that that's a dynamic uh, number and a dynamic discussion. I mean, having more leverage at a low point in the cycle where asset prices are low. And you're constructive on, on rate development, then then leaning forward and and taking on some more more leverage makes sense. The other thing is, as asset prices increase, and we've seen a significant increase in asset prices, you know your your debt to asset goes down, even though you still owe the same same amount to the bank as you did the day before, right? So it's really I think it's about focusing on delevering, but there's I don't I wouldn't put a target number on it because as we go forward and and cash flows are are starting to become you know, really meaningful and robust. For us, it's about 
first things first in, in priority for us is to, is to pay back um, our revolvers and put ourselves back in a position where we have undrawn revolvers and some unencumbered assets. So when you know last year, uh, I will tell you we were constructive on the market going into 2020 uh, with IMO 2020 regulation, and then of course COVID came. But even though we were constructive, we had unencumbered assets without debt on them and fully undrawn revolvers, which which enabled us to go through last year and a very weak market in Q2 um, without doing anything that was you know expensive. Um, or punitive uh, to shareholder value, and so we want to we want to get back there. In fact, last week we announced the acquisition of two vessels, which um, we funded with uh, issuance of shares uh, through our ATM for about half the value of the 44 million, and the other from cash on the balance sheet. So those ships won't. Our intention is not to put any debt on those ve those vessels. And so what you can see here is painting a picture of us continuing to pay down debt, not just through our normal amortization, which is significant, but but through, you know, again, those revolvers. And in fact, there were um, two other Ultramaxes we acquired earlier in the year, and we, we took out um, 24 million of debt on those ships, but we did it in the form of a revolver actually with a, a tenor just out to December. So clearly with a view that we would, we would pay those down before the end of this year. So you'll see us you'll see this company delever as we go forward based on current market dynamics. Okay, yeah, it certainly makes sense. And I mean, your current leverage, uh, you know, according to our analytics, we might be off a couple of percent or so, but it, it's the low 40s. So it, it's not uh, something we're concerned about in any regard. Um, I, I did notice when you bought those last two ships uh, and you just mentioned it, you used the ATM facility a little bit. And, you know, at the current trading price, and, and I, you know, the calculation that I came up with is that you sold shares around 1.1, uh, 1 .1, 1 1.2 times NAV, right? So it's an accretive transaction. You're actually building value for the shareholders. But now we have asset values rallying. We have the FFAs. I mean, they're on a tear today. It's it's nine June, and they were just amazing this morning. Um, asset values, if anything, are lagging the FFAs. Uh, your NAV is rising. If anything, today you trade at NAV or below NAV. Um, so how do we think about that ATM? Is that just for special situations, or should we expect that to be somewhat active? Yeah, well, we put the ATM in place. Um, I think we felt it was good good housekeeping to have it available. And so if, as an as you said, opportunistically, if an opportunity presented itself that was a creative and, and we felt the dynamics were, were you know, positive, then we, then we would act on it. But we don't feel uh, any need that we have to go out and do more. We've acquired nine vessels over the last six months um, and, and feel really good about that. We've grown our fleet about 20% over the last four and a half years since we started our fleet renewal and, and growth. And, you know, I mean, the fleet would be a lot larger. We we monetized, sold 20 of our smaller and least efficient vessels. We now have only two vessels older than 13 years that are that are actually about 18 years old. And our intention is to sell those ships, you know, in the in the not too distant future. They're both due for dry dock um, by the middle of next year, and we typically sell our older ships prior to taking them through special survey dry docks. But, you know, we feel with our current fleet size, while, while scale, you know, growing the business is, is, is nice to do and there's incremental benefits for it, we don't feel a need to go out and do anything unless, unless it's, uh, it's accretive for shareholders. Okay, so it sounds like you're saying that the fleet is, is pretty right size, and, and then of course you're flagging that there's two vessels that are that are non-core and, and they're probably gone in a year. The rest of the vessels in your fleet are all pretty homogenous. Are those gonna be core vessels then? Yeah, the, the rest of the fleet is uh, the, aver the average age, even including the older ships, is, is under nine years, which is the same as it was almost six years ago when I got to Eagle, um, which is more than I can say for myself. And uh, and you know they're all they're all between you know the excluding the older ships, they're all between fifty eight and sixty four thousand dead weight. So you don't pay a dividend yet, but you're I mean at this point at least cash flows are surging. I understand you want to delever a little bit, but at what point do we turn that corner and, and we can start to expect some sort of payout? Yeah, so that that's a decision obviously that for, that the board will will uh, will take, and 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 clearly given the developments in the market, it, it's it's front and center. Um, so it's premature for me to say when we we might institute a dividend, but I, but I will say this, it, from my from my vantage point, um, the a dividend from Eagle, uh, when and if, will have to meet two criteria: one. Um, that it, it'll be meaningful. It's not going to be, you know, window dressing. It needs to. It needs to be done for the reasons because it's it's returning a meaningful amount of capital to shareholders. And secondly, that it's sustainable. I mean, one thing I'm pretty uh, firm in my view, and that is the one thing worse 
you know, it, it, to put a dividend in and then to cut it or, or stop it completely, um, I think is, is, is worse than not having one. So we, we will be very considerate about how, how we go about it and, and it should be, you know, clear and easy to, easy to compute. But, but if those two things that it's sustainable and meaningful are, are really important to me. Yeah, I mean, those are very important goalposts. It is, so is, are you saying the dividend basically would not be a variable structure? It wouldn't be something like, you know, 50% of earnings or something like that? No, I'm not saying that. Um, be, but, but you know, wh whether it's a combination, um, but I don't, I don't want to get too, too far here because it really is ultimately a board decision. Uh, but, but I do think it should be, it should be clear, e easy to calculate and, and, and meaningful. But, but, to have a, a strictly fixed dividend given the cyclical nature and volatility and shipping over the long haul, even though we're constructive on the market, um, you know, might not be the right way to go. So you'll have to stay tuned. Yeah, well, we'll certainly stay tuned and, and you know, your cash flows are, are going nowhere but up right now. So hopefully the odds will be will be in your favor. Um, you, you had some interesting stuff with your stock, just mechanics and housekeeping, if you will, over the last year. Uh, you had the big reverse split, right, which, which uh, you know, doesn't really do anything for value of the company, but it, it enables you to appeal right to more institutions and uh, larger shareholders who might not want to trade something that's like three dollars or four dollars, right? Um, but at the same time, after that split, the the liquidity has dried up a lot, and there's no options in the market whatsoever. And I know you know for mar options sometimes are used for speculating, but they're also used by investors to you know sell calls and lock in and hedge and that sort of thing. Um, is there anything you can do from you know your perspective, your board's perspective, your relationships with your banks uh, to work on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I mean uh, the, the the answer is you know potentially, but but you know um, the reverse stock split was done opportunistically with a view, as you said, to become more attractive and also given the uncertainty around COVID that we didn't want to be in a position where we had to do it. Um, you know, unfortunately, we never got there, but there was a lot of uncertainty in the market, given the, you know, the fact that the pandemic, nobody really knew how long and how deep it would go. So, so we felt it was better to get out in front and do that, you know, in, in terms of, in terms of, you know, dynamics and options, you know, it remains to be seen, I would say. Okay. I mean, that's fair. I know you don't have specifics on that. It is just something I hear a lot. You know, I, I, folks are looking at Eagle and they're like, man, I really like this company, but there, there's no options in it. And there's no way for me to, you know, sell calls, uh, especially there's no dividend, right? So, you know, folks like to buy a stock and especially one that's doing well, like dry bulk and, and maybe sell calls and generate income that way or some sort of alternative approach. So it may be just something to put on the docket uh, your next time you meet with your banks or something. And cause I know they control that the, the investment banks and whatnot. Um, you know, a, a little bit of a pivot away from that. Um, but maybe back towards you know the capital allocation standpoint, uh, consolidation is is desperately needed in this sector. There's way too many dry bulk stocks. Uh, there's way too many ships that are still in private hands. Is there any realistic pathway to more consolidation, or or do you think that's kind of tapped out here? Well, the answer is I absolutely think there is. I mean, first of all, we we are um, consolidating you know number ultra maxes as we acquire them. Uh, the most recent ones. Uh, you know, it's pretty widely uh, assumed that from nautical, nautical, we've acquired six vessels from them. Uh, we did uh, nine ships from Green Green Ship uh, back a number of years ago. So not public companies, but consolidating from from private, which really you know dominates uh, the, the mid size segment within shipping. You know, in the public space, I think the answer is yes. Uh, you know, as well as I do, there's a lot of reasons why you know public uh, dry bulk companies have have not uh, gotten together. Um, some, but Eagle is not, doesn't have those reasons. We have no, you know, poison pill or other, other you know, shareholder, non-friendly shareholder uh, things. We have a fully independent board with the exception of myself as a ma member of management. So we are, we are definitely open to, you know, the idea that consolidation is, is positive, particularly from a capital market standpoint. And I, I do think there's, there's opportunities there, but no question, you know, it's, it's a topic that's been talked about for a very long time. And, and much much slower than anyone I think would have would would have expected a number of years ago. Yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd certainly like to see it as investors, especially the more long term folks. You know, we want to see solid companies with strong governance, you know, such as yourselves and, and a select number of your peers, uh, you know, not growing for the sake of growing, but ideally consolidating and, and getting the, the vessels away from some of the uh, inferior structures and, and tonnage out there. And it, it becomes a bigger factor as well as, as we start to look at environmental impacts. 
right? And, and responsible corporate governance and, and that sort of thing, which I suppose is a good pivot to, to ask you about, you know, the EEXI standards in 2023 and any sort of other potential environmental regulations. Does Eagle Bulk have any exposure to this? What What is kind of your strategy to uh, address those regulations? Yeah, so EEXI, um, as you said, likely will come into force in 2023. And, and it's really about a year later before, you know, all the ships are, are fully have their first first audit. Um, we, given the age profile of our fleet and, and the actual operational profile of ships, we think it'll have a very minimal impact on, on Eagle. Um, but, but we obviously will, will need to comply with it, which, which might mean putting some equipment on board the ship in terms of limitation, you know, engine limitation. But we think the speed impact itself will be quite minimal. You know, it'll, it'll likely have a, it will have a more, profound impact on, on older vessels, 20 years plus, about 10% of the fleet is over 20 years at the moment. And so I think you will see, you know, while while in a market like we're in today, 27,000, it's unlikely that that speed reduction will cause a 20 year old ship to decide to, to you know, scrap instead of trade. But but directionally, it, it's, it makes that ship less competitive as, it's, as it has to slow down to stay uh, stay more efficient um, or in, to meet EXI, EXI. And so therefore, you know, we think it's a good thing as long as you're on the right side of that, of that you know, curve, then, then it's positive for dry bulk and, and should be helpful for rates. But we don't see it as a wholesale, you know, a major, major change, but directionally positive. Yeah, so it certainly makes sense that that will help, you know, the eco tonnage and some of the younger vessels and stuff that's already compliant. Uh, what about a potential a bunker tonnage tax? I know that's not in place yet, and it's just a proposal that was thrown out there. But how would that impact Eagle Bulk if that went into effect? Yeah, so, so we're spot players. So effectively, you know, fuel is a pass through cost. When you when you relet a vessel on time charter, then it's a pass through cost. And when we do chartering when we when we uh, employ our vessels on voyage basis we get paid a per ton basis to carry cargo inclusive of the fuel cost so clearly higher higher cost to move cargo is directionally you know negative for for volume because it costs more but historically what we see is that dry bulk demand is highly inelastic to freight rate changes in other words another way of saying it is that the the cost to move cargo compared to the finished good, whether it's steel uh, or, or or fertilizer for crops or, or or even grain for for feed, you know, for whether it's for for you know China soybeans for the pig population or or grain for human consumption, the cost of freight is really small uh, compared to the end. So we don't think it'll have a, a meaningful impact on on uh, dry bulk demand, and it's effectively a pass through cost. The only you know, time it's not is if you had a fixed contract in place without a, an allowance for a bunker um, type of, you know, a carbon levy. And then the owner who had that had that contract in place would be responsible. But that doesn't that doesn't pertain to Eagle because of the short term nature of our contracts and the way we employ our ships. Right. And I, I would hope you're savvy enough that if you did write a long term contract, you, you had a you had a nice little carve out there for any sort of carbon tax or or a bunker tonnage. I, I'm sure you would take care of that in your contract. We're, we're, we're quite aware of what might be coming down the pipe. Of course, of course. So related to that a little bit is the scrubber spreads. And you have a pretty comprehensive scrubber program that you completed already on the fleet. Um, what sort of day rate savings or, or spreads are you seeing today in, in terms of, I think the spread's about $120 a ton. How does that translate to like a TCE number? Yeah, so if you look at it from a standpoint, it's a, it's about, um, you know, sorry, I'm just doing it. It's about $1,600 $1, a day on, on our ships. And then we we still have um, three four ships that don't have scrubbers, um, and we're taking delivery of two more of the super maxes that we we acquired. So when you spread it out over the fleet, you end up with about fourteen hundred benefit overall across the fleet. Are you are you at the point with those vessels that don't have scrubbers where when you throw them in the dry dock, you're going to put a scrubber on, or is that that ship kind of sailed, so to speak? <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't say the ship has sailed. It really it really is dependent on on future spreads we're constructive on it in fact bloomberg had an article today about jet fuel sales taking off and 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 passengers coming back we think you know the the greatest correlation for fuel spreads historically which we didn't have vlsfo but what we've always had spreads between gas oil and hfo hsfo and um you know those spreads are highly correlated to underlying you know crude prices 
But the other thing about VOSFO is is demand for other mid distillates. And you know, prior to IMO, you know, prior to 2020, I couldn't have thought of a worse scenario, right, where the world stops flying and crude prices go negative. Having said that, we were able, you know, we came through the year given our hedges on on fuel spreads with a with an effective price spread of about 150 last year. Obviously, because the market started really wide and we we started hedging um, early on before before COVID became uh, became a factor. And now, as you said, this year we're now at around you know one 120 in Singapore, 110 in Rotterdam. But we we expect that that spread will likely widen as demand for jet fuel and other mid distillates come back and the world opens up. So so we're we're constructive on it and and you know we think we're in a good position to capture that. We don't have any spread spread trades at the moment. We reversed all of the 2021 spreads that we had. We bought them back right around $100 uh, with, with a view that they would widen out. Yeah, it certainly makes sense. Is there is there a point where you would consider hedging it in? Is it maybe like 140, 150 range or, or any sort of view on that? Yeah, I think I think our view would be, you know, not so much what the number is, but why are we why we felt that it, the direction might change. All right. So so you know, I don't I don't think there's a reason to believe that spreads are capped, um, you know, to the upside. So if we felt that there was reason that you know fuel prices overall would continue to increase, then you know less likely. But but you know it's never a bad day to hedge. I mean, we we use derivatives uh, uh, on on a on a you know, daily basis, uh, locking in, you know, our regular bunker exposure when we lock in contracts. So we definitely will, you know, we'll evaluate that, you know, as, as spreads widen out. But at the moment, given the, you know, 110, 120 number, you know, we don't have a, won't have, don't have a view on, on doing anything too soon. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I mean, it's just important, I guess, for investors and, and traders listening on the call today and listening to the recording later to, you know, kind of keep in mind that not only do you benefit from a slight spread due to your in-house logistics platform and derivative trading, you also benefit from a spread due to these scrubbers. So you can take what like the Supermax uh, index, uh, uh, I don't want to butcher it, BSI or whatever it is, and you can add a slight premium to that, right? And then that's closer to what your actual benchmark would be. Is that fair? Yes, I think the way to look at it, and if you go on our on our website, our investor deck, we show um, over the last almost six years now that I've been at Eagle, right? We show our our net TC performance against the Baltic Supermax index, and so you can look back and see exactly what that is. You know, we've we've outperformed the index in 15 of the last 17 quarters, um, and and uh, not last quarter. And directionally. You know our guidance, although strong, I think you know we we gave guidance for the second second quarter. When I say guidance, that we were 71% covered for the quarter at the time of our last earnings call at over $20,000 net TCE um, for for our supermax ultramax fleet. And so, you know, given given the rates, the current rate at 27,000, it's it's almost, it's virtually impossible to to beat a rapidly rising market like that. To start overall the long haul, our view is to, to outperform, you know, the the index, the Baltic Supermax index. But you know, like I said, beating a rapidly rising market is is very challenging, if not impossible. Uh, conversely, when markets fall rapidly, it's very easy to beat them. So our view is you need to look back over, you know, a 12 month or even longer period to evaluate performance. And and if you if you look at the graph, I think it's pretty demonstrable that the methodology. And now the scrubbers since 2020, you know, add considerably to a performance that historically has been, you know, well above the BSI. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly clear. I, I've seen that chart you're talking about, and, and the spread is is pretty evident over time. Obviously, there's going to be one or two quarters here and there. Um, you know, this quarter is, has been very strong, and, and at points, it was like a, a, a straight-up line, right? So it's harder to outperform it in that sort of market. But over time— By the way, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm happy to explain why we didn't outperform, you know, a market that went from, you know, fifteen to $25,000 in a right. Yeah, it's a luxury problem, right? So we're not complaining. We're certainly not complaining on that one. So, you know, I think one thing is, as we start to wrap up here, one question that we really we really need to spend more time on, on questions like this, especially for investors considering a company like Eagle Bulk, but what are the big risks here? I mean, obviously there's volatility, it's a commodity market. Uh, what sort of stuff can derail this? Because demand is very robust. We're expecting demand to continue growing for the next two, two three years. Supply is very low. Um, what sort of events can derail this market and send us back to the uh, the stone ages of 2014 and 15? Yeah, well, I, I 
I think that's unlikely. But what can what can you know um, you know derail the, the current strength in the market? I think one big question at the moment people have is how much of this demand is related to you know the reopening and and stimulus payments and things like that versus a more sustainable you know uh, return and growth. You know, and and of course the answer is you know not sure except that infrastructure spend is not a three month or six month right it takes it takes you know years for that and same with construction and, and because of the broad based nature of the commodities we carry you know we feel good about it we we look to year over year global GDP as as a proxy for the demand because when you start to b- try and build it up from individual commodities it's really difficult because of the nature of our ships that pivot from one commodity to another um, and you know the supply side is really baked at the moment and I think it's worth taking just a minute to talk about you know one of the reasons I'm I'm so positive on the supply side is not that people this time have said okay let's let's show restrain and and, and not order ships but there's a lot of reasons headwinds why not I mean the most um, the most uh, significant one over the last few months are just the number of orders in other sectors, particularly container ships, uh, record ordering in large complex container ships, options being declared on on LNG vessels, VL, you know, dual fuel VLCCs. Essentially, with steel prices going up and inflation, options are being declared everywhere. So we just see yard space drying up dramatically. Where now, if you want to order a ship, you're looking at really the second half of 23, and any and with any Kind of re- real volume. You're talking going into 24, and so that feels much different than what we've had for the last really 12, 13 years, which was an oversupply or at least a full, you know, fully available supply of, of of shipyards. And shipyards in general prefer to build, you know, higher margin projects, which are more complicated vessels if they can. So you know that plus higher cost of capital, uh, access, access to to bank financing, things like that, and then and then the whole issue around question on decarbonization you know as a company i wouldn't want to take delivery of a ship in 2023 that will be only 12 years old in 2035 versus assets we've been buying call it you know on average 2015 vessel will be 20 years old in 2035 i think the the tail risk there of the 2035 to 2050 years is is really is really significant and i think others see that as well so you know we feel um, quite positive about the supply side and and when we look at you know global GDP, you know that that's that's positive as well. We don't need demand growth like we had in two thousand in the mid you know 2013, 14, 15 to overcome you know excessive supply. Dry bulk dry bulk supply next year is expected to be a little bit over one percent. Right, that certainly makes sense, Gary. And, and you know, and I look at the Newbert prices every every couple of weeks. I look at those, and they keep rising, right, because of steel prices and the slot timing gets it's pushed further and further back. And you brought up a fantastic point about looking out to like 2035 and thinking about how old your vessel is going to be. And yeah, you take it one step further and look at 2030, right? And and your vessel might only be six years old, and it might already be obsolete. And then that's just uh, it's like boneheaded, right, to think of ordering a vessel today for delivery in 2024 that is just conventional fuel with a scrubber, right? It's just, I, I don't understand it, especially when, you know, resale values haven't surged that much yet. Obviously they're up, but they they haven't surged to a point where, where the economics are bad. Um, it, let's, let's say that, you know, I'm an irresponsible private equity firm and I want to repeat history and, and go back to 2012 and 13 and, and blow all my money on new builds. And I come into this space. How long will it take me to, to build a new fleet of ultra maxes or super maxes? Are we talking mid 24, early 24? When, when's kind of the delivery time frame for new builds today? Yeah, well, well, it would be a series of orders and you might get the first one even in 23. But before you got any real you know, scale to it, you're talking mid 24 or later. And I think that people also understand and have seen what's happened. I mean, if you want to, if you want an asset play in dry bulk, buying a secondhand vessel now or 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 a year ago or two years ago uh, has would do, has delivered a higher return than a new building that you're flipping, right? And because at the moment having a ship on the water is highly valuable compared to having a ship even delivering six months or a year from now, given you know that the second half of this year is trading at 27. You know that's that cash flow all goes into the calculation. So I think there's much more compelling reason if you want to own steel to buying a secondhand vessel. And the other thing about buying a secondhand vessel is you're also not changing the forward supply demand equation, right? So so there's a whole lot of reasons why. And and you know at Eagle, you know 
uh, I'm a big believer, actions speak louder than words. You know, we've we've acquired 29 ships over the last five years, and we haven't ordered any. Every single ship we've ordered has has been, you know, one resale of a contract that someone walked away from, but everything else has been between two and six years old. Yeah, certainly makes sense, Gary. Uh, keep leading by example, please. And if the private equity folks come around and offer you cheap capital for new builds, uh, please convince them that we need to stay with the, uh, the secondhand resale. I, I mean, I'm a young guy, but, you know, you spend 10 years in shipping and I'm already getting gray hairs. And I, I remember, you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, and, and the money just started flowing in. And, you know, it was it was kind of common thing to order new builds, right? The eco ships were kind of the new thing at that point. And uh, I think everybody's worst fear is a repeat of that whatever it might be, you know, super eco or whatever the next generation is. And if we can keep those guys out of the market, that'd be good. Um, one question I had in the chat, kind of a follow-up, and, and we did kind of discuss it a little bit earlier, but we're seeing some, ter some term coverage for six months, 12 months. The rates are getting a lot better for this six and 12 month stuff. Does Eagle have any appetite for, for fixing stuff for a year or so? Or I know we talked about derivatives. Is there a lot of appetite for that or, or is it mostly at this point spot market? Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, because when we talked about FFAs and you said, you know, take some of the balance of this year, but not first half of next year. If you look at a one-year charter right now, it's effectively based on Q3, 4, 1, 2, right? I mean, and, and there's a high, high correlation between the two, because if there wasn't, there would be an arbitrage, right? You know, buy the FFA, sell the, sell or charter at your ship or vice versa. So so the the answer is we, we do take, you know, cover, forward cover. Um, we haven't conveyed what exactly our position is at this time. We did once before in the midst of COVID, second quarter last year. We 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 disclosed it because we wanted people to understand that we had cover going forward and they could, they could calculate it. But our view at the moment is, you know, consider Eagle a spot player, but we absolutely do take positions on the forward market and, and arbitraging uh, cash flows. Will we re ship for a year? The answer is, you know, we, we will if we think it's fair value, but we'll also sell potentially, you know, an FFA through through the first half of next year. But at this point, we're not conveying what it is. Um, but but um, rest assured, you know, we, we manage we manage our, our fleet and, and forward cash flows. And, and the more as 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 the forward curve comes up right now at 17, as you said, you know, 22 was was, you know, anemic for quite a while. As those start to come up, you know, we likely will layer in you know, more more uh, positions to lock in cash flows going forward. And at a certain point, I think we will decide to to convey with more specificity exactly what that is from a modeling standpoint, as opposed to that that Eagles a spot player. Certainly, certainly makes sense, uh, Gary. Great answer there. Um, we're, we're wrapping things up here. I just want to conclude on this note. Look, there's a lot of drive bulk companies out there. There's there's way too many in my opinion. Um, what differentiates Eagle Bulk? Why should folks, you know, looking at a screener of stuff and they're looking at all the different stocks and you know they're like, well, no dividend, no options, but I see this EGLE symbol. Why should I buy Eagle? What makes you uh, different and or better than your peers? Yeah, look, I, I appreciate the question. I mean, we are. We are a company that's that's focused on execution. Uh, I'm I'm I've been in dry bulk for for this is my 34th year in dry bulk. Uh, this active management approach. Our chief commercial officer. Um, he's we worked together for 20 years and we have a track record of outperforming the index and that's meaningful. A thousand dollar outperformance equates to 18 million dollars of incremental EBITDA. Um, and and this we positioned this fleet in such a way and grew the fleet to really for this moment. Right. And, and, and over the last five years, that fleet renewal and growth um, in terms of governance and ESG in, in Weber's uh, governance scorecard, Eagles rated number one out of 52 public companies in terms of governance. Uh, so from that standpoint, you know, very you know, shareholder friendly and all the criteria that go into that. And I think we, we've shown that we, we we're, we're very transparent. We tell people, you know, what our approach is and what we're going to do. And then we've we've been able to execute and, and do that. So I think. You know, the other thing is the mid-size segment, I think, has a lot of compelling reasons, uh, less volatility. I think the supply-demand fundamentals in it look really good. And we think Eagle, Eagle you know, as a company is, is a really interesting, um, you know, company in this market with a lot of differentiating factors that I mentioned. And finally, the one you said earlier as well, you know, we have the largest uh, scrubber-fitted fleet in the Supermax, Ultramax space as well. So, so all those things together, I think, make Eagle, you know, a compelling company to look at. Wow. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, just need to throw a dividend on there and, and you've checked all the boxes. So uh, thanks again for joining us today, Gary. Definitely appreciate your insights.
Thank you. I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity, and, and thanks to everybody who, who dialed in for the call. Thank you. This includes another iteration of Value Investors Edge Live. We just hosted Gary Vogel, CEO of Eagle Bulk, stock symbol E-G-L-E, -E, recording on the afternoon of 9 June 2021 at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Time. As a reminder, nothing on the call today constitutes official company guidance or investment recommendations in any form.